I can turn you off, watch. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to Anime Club After Dark's Movie Reviews, a spoiler-free discussion detailing the good, the bad, and the downright ridiculous of anime movies. I'm your host, Alex, and tonight I am joined by our czar of source material, John. It's been 17 years. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like it, doesn't it? It's been it's been over, what, two and a half weeks since the last time you and I pretty much even talked. Yeah. But yeah, this is uh, this is our first time being together since uh, 2022. Not the first time we've recorded since 2022, because that was a uh, Natai and I did a spoiler cast for Arcane, which hopefully will have come out the week before you guys hear this. I hope. Yeah? <laughs> um, question mark. Question mark. Uh, hint, hint, nudge, we'll, nudge. We'll editor San, please hurry the fuck up. We need an episode. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not saying that, but since you said it, you're not saying it, but you're heavily implying it, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> uh but yeah we we've gotten together uh tonight to uh do a movie review for a movie that john himself has uh chosen to do and i think it's one that's uh somewhat near and dear to his heart because he's mentioned it multiple times on the podcast that this is a uh a film that he's seen more than once yeah so uh tonight's film is the 2004 cgi apple seed right so yes this is a movie that I remember when I first got into anime, right? Like, I, I did the whole marathon bleach, and I started watching, like, um... You had nowhere to go but up. I mean, what? <laughs> I watched bleach, I caught up, I watched Naruto, I caught up, then I started watching different things. Like, uh, I remember... <laughs> I'm trying to fucking remember what the fuck it was. So, Rie Kugamiya was um, the hottest voice actress during this time. From shows like... Shakugan no Shana to uh, Familiar of Zero. These are, again, all shows I watch during this time after Bleach. So, mm. The Sundari Queen. The Sundari Queen herself, right? So then I don't remember how I stumbled upon watching Appleseed. I think I just saw it somewhere, and I was just, like, like looking through an anime list just A to Z, right? <laughs> and mm. I'm pretty sure I just clicked on it and just started watching it. And it just, like, it blew my mind because, first of all, I love Mecha right anything with robots fucking fighting i'll watch <laughs> don't judge me anything with robots fucking or fighting fucking or fighting i'll still watch as long as it just has robots okay <laughs> i watched pacific rim because it had fucking kaijus and mechas man all i care is about john just really likes robots he's a robosexual <laughs> i mean i'm not denying this <laughs> and uh <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that because one of the uh so appleseed is a very strange anime it's film because mm. for one it is the very first rated r cg movie it is and that's that's pretty nuts to me considering like you know we have cg movies we have a bunch of movies with a bunch of cgi in it for example today that are rated r but mm. it's crazy to think about it it's only been what oh my god it's only been 18 years um yeah <laughs> i was i was 14 years old when this uh when this movie came out <laughs> yeah and uh i am not 14 years old anymore <laughs> unfortunately no neither am i <laughs> but uh the uh the movie is directed by obviously shinji aramaki i believe we talked about this last time right we want we did ghost in the shell last time uh we did yeah so we said hey the next movie is also by shinji aramaki which is hilarious. And also, this is based on a manga by Masumune Shiro, the creator of Ghost in the Shell. Of Ghost in the Shell. <laughs> so just one fact. Like, <laughs> it was not intended. I kind of just thought about Appleseed because I was asked what movie. I was like, I don't know, Appleseed? I haven't seen it in a while. Mm. I've seen it so many times, though, that I didn't really need to rewatch it to remember everything that happened. Because I've seen this it is fucking movie It is so worth mentioning times. that uh, that Aramaki did work on Ghost in the Shell, the 1995 Ghost in the Shell movie, but he did not direct it. Um, that was Momoro Oshii who directed that one. Oh shit! Is he the? But no, he, he did, did. He did. He did work on the movie. He just did not direct it. Okay. Yeah. No, Aramaki's uh, Blade Runner. Yes, he he is he is currently. Um, or I, I guess the the newest thing that he has worked on is um, Blade Runner Black Lotus. Yes. Yeah. Um, he was also the director of Ghost in the Shell uh, Standalone Complex 2045 back in 2020. Oh. And he is um, directing the Ultraman CG anime currently as well. Yeah, with um, Aramaki. 
I had a funny bit queued up here about Aramaki, but... Was it going to be about robots? <laughs> no. Moving on. I feel like me and Aramaki <laughs> would get along in real life really fucking well. <laughs> he does like he does like robots, and he does like just CG in general. Oh, the, uh, the running theme here is uh, Cyberpunk Future. <laughs> yeah, that too. That too. He does seem to, to kind of gravitate towards that. Um, but like you said, this is based on a manga also by Masamune Shiro, who created Ghost in the Shell. Um, the movie itself was was like was co-written by uh, Haruka Honda and uh, Sutomu Kamishiro, um, and it was produced by that just behemoth of the anime industry known as Digital Frontier. <laughs> um, listen, if you <laughs> if you uh, don't know who Digital Frontier is? It's it's okay. It, it's it's a okay. They really haven't done a whole lot in the anime sphere that besides you know, Appleseed, Appleseed X Machina, uh, the Resident Evil CG animes. Yeah, um, I don't understand. You know, I, I feel like we should have probably researched more about Digital Frontier, but they're they're not very well known. I I don't know what type of like production studio digital frontier is they, i w- i will say they've worked on more um like cg special effects for live action films and they've worked on anime yeah like they're they're primarily just a cg company that people contract mm-hmm. out to and they've worked a shit ton on video game cutscene animations yeah like it's just obviously i think it's one of the studios that like Back in the day, they started up with this new technology, and they've kind of just been a mainstay. Like, everyone just goes to them for work, because it's like, well, this equipment More is very less. expensive, so we can just contract it out. Yeah. Um, that I, for, I, I'm looking at it right now. As far as I can tell, I think they may have done uh, CGI work on all of the cutscenes from the Yakuza franchise. Even fucking better. Yakuza's <laughs> cutscenes are amazing, though. <laughs> but that's because the writing is really good. Um mm. And this film was released in April 18th, 2004. God. In Japan, yeah. Uh, it was, uh, it feels like forever ago. Uh, it had its North American release uh, less than a year later on January 14th, a day after my birthday, uh, 2005. Um, it was picked up at the time by Jinian Entertainment. It was only released in 30 American theaters. Um, Jinian re- uh, later released it a few months later on May 10th, 2005 on DVD. Uh, for some reason, Jinian decided they didn't want to be really associated with this, so they took their name and logo off of everything. Yeah, it's really weird that Jinian would not, like, I mean, I get it. <laughs> so, we gotta we gotta move back to the past, right? This is circa 2004. Mm-hmm. CG was just starting to like make its way around. Like we've had CG in movies and stuff for sure, but primarily the only thing that again CG was known for back then was just cartoons, Disney cartoons specifically, yeah. right? Like Pixar, Toy Story. Toy Story. <laughs> so this is a very like hard franchise not franchise um it must have been a really hard sell at the time to get it even into theaters well that's what i'm saying so um (laughs) this film released with a a budget of 10 million and the north american box office with including home release video oh i didn't know that it was only 1.65 million (laughs) yeah i tried to find i tried to find a japanese box office for this film and i could not for the life of me find any any kind of box office information uh for apple seed in japan if anyone out there does have a link to that i'd, I'd love to see it um you can obviously put it below in the comments if you do uh but i could not find it yeah unfortunately <laughs> like we have a, a bunch of we live in the, the information age right where we have access to all like budgets from across the world from like some shitty indie film that could be released in like ukraine or something we'd figure out the budget and the people behind it 2004 was a wild time where these things are just not known by anyone outside of the sphere of influence. Like Mm -hmm. good luck finding any of this data. The only reason we have North North American box office is because we have a robust tracking system for that. Like, I don't know what it is. It's called box office mojo and it's a great resource for things like this. Yeah. Because we've had film film started in America, right? Well, actually film was the, the, this is a huge tangent, but yes, film was actually invented in, uh, france oh oh 
That explains the French. Anyway, <laughs> but uh, Hollywood. I'm talking about Hollywood's here. So we're really big on entertainment and especially movies here in the United mm-hmm. States. So we like to keep track of these things just to like, oh, my gosh, look at how much money this made. Look at Hollywood. It's so big. So, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, this is a box office flop, just like Ghost in the Shell was, which is a, a damn shame. Because, again, like we talked about with Ghost in the Shell, animation equals cartoons cartoons equals four kids so mm-hmm. on top of being that and being a hard sell to sell to kids this is rated r rated r movies make the worst box office sales at least back in the day i'm not sure what the statistics are now but i remember pre-2010 rated r movies made way less money than pg-13 movies because one you've got a broader audience when you have pg-13 and you can still keep some edgy things in pg-13 like Mm-hmm. You'll watch some PG-13 and think it was great because it had just the right amount of edginess, like uh, violence and action. But Rated R, like, for a very long time, Rated R meant, like, oh, we're going to do excessive gore. We're going to do super explicit, like, you might see titties and stuff. So it's a very hard sell because, one, adults don't watch as much movies and consume entertainment as kids do because, you know, adults will always be adults. They don't have enough time. <laughs> like... To be honest, your market for most things is going to be 13 and up. Your teenagers to young adults are going to be the biggest spenders of any market you go into. Like That 13 to 25 demographic is king. Basically, it, it dethrones everything in terms of sales. So <laughs> it's a hard sell already being a cartoon. <laughs> Triple so because it's rated R. I'm not surprised only 30 theaters fucking picked it up. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um... And again, and the movie itself has a total runtime of 103 minutes. Um, I, I I don't know if I speak for John, but I I will say for myself, uh, it feels every single minute of that. Um, <laughs> it does. So, oh, we're not even on narrative pacing yet. So, uh, no, but we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll, we'll get, we'll to, get that. to that um, if I remember. But let, 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 let's actually talk about uh, the art and animation because I think that's listen. Okay, this is this is a full CG anime, and it came out in 2004. My God, is it dated by today's standards? Yeah, holy so, shit, my eyes. One thing that in my interact, which game class was this? I just had this class. Uh, oh my God! In my design class, we talked about art style. Right. And Mm -hmm. one thing that doesn't seem to uh, always date itself is pixel art and 2D animated video games. Mm -hmm. For some reason, like you can play a game like Hollow Knight, for example, in 50 years, Hollow Knight is still going to be a super solid fucking game. It's going to look still great because it's pixel art or it's not actually pixel art, but it's uh, 2D animated and it's never going to date itself. And the problem with a bunch of 3D like uh, shooters, like with hyper realistic graphics and stuff, like COD Modern Warfare, it looks great for 2019. I guarantee you, in 20 years, it's gonna look like ass, just like how Call of Duty mm-hmm. 2 looks like ass to today's standard, right? Like, I remember playing Resident Evil 1 on PlayStation originally and thinking, "Whoa, these are hyper realistic! Like, there's violence and blood. There's there's zombies. It's so crazy." And then I play it again now, and I'm like, "Holy shit! Everything's like unrecognizable. Everything's <laughs> so polygonal. Like, it it looks so bad, right?" It hasn't aged that well. No, and you look at things like even uh, like Final Fantasy VII, for example. At the time, Final Fantasy VII invented um, was it flash movies? I believe it had full on FMVs, which would which is what made it like super popular. It was like, oh fuck, it looks so good, and then you play the game and it's super blocky, but you didn't care because the FMBs fucking just ruled everything with this the uh, cutscenes. It was popping. It was popping. Have you gone back to play Final Fantasy VII since the original release? Like, not the remake, but the old one. Man, does it look bad. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely an acquired taste these days, yeah, isn't it? And <laughs> even though I say that, I just wanted to mention. The CG is still not as bad as X Arm, and that came out in 2021. <laughs> yeah, well, X Arm at this point, I think, is a fucking meme. <laughs> yeah, X Arm was a studio full of people that did not know what they were doing because they're all fucking brand new, and they tried to make a fucking anime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like like you said, like for its time though, like this was very fluid animation, and, and really at the time, what did we have to compare it to? Fucking Disney Pixar shit. Like The Incredibles came out the exact same year. Yeah. And if you rewatch The Incredibles 1, it is very dated and you will notice all the like really mm. bad CG because we watched yeah. like, The Incredibles 2 just came out, right? Like 
a year or two ago, I think it was, two, three years ago? Within the last couple of years. In the last couple of years, uh, The Incredibles 2 came out, and it looks phenomenal. And if you rewatch Incredibles 1, it's going to look really bad. Like, it still looks good, because, again, I remember watching it in theaters and having my fucking mind blown of, like, whoa, CG, whoa, you know, cartoon stuff, woo! And uh, so the only thing comparable is that, and, you know, that's Disney budget stuff. $10 million. Yeah, Dis- that, they, they made The Incredibles on a much larger budget than $10 million. Yeah, it was more like, I want to say $65 million, but I don't actually know the I- number. <laughs> It was it was definitely a lot more than ten million. Watch us look it up, and it was actually like they did it on two million. Actually, <laughs> they did it on five dollars. <laughs> Fucking, I, I bet this is what Disney <laughs> can do with five dollars. Yeah, sure, whatever. But because of the CG, it definitely dates itself. Um, but it it's such a it looks so fluid though, which is the weirdest thing. When you think of CG, you think it's blocky and moves really weird. Like think Toy Story one CG, because mm-hmm. again. We compare a lot of, um, we're comparing a lot of Western films to animation films because CG was still relatively new to Japan. Animation did not use a lot of CG at all, and especially like full CG. Especially full like, they CG. They might use like they they might use CG in a couple of scenes to like you know build out some of the the special effects, but they never very few at the before Apple Seed were like full CG. Yeah, and like <laughs> two thousand one. We saw the release of Final Fantasy Spirits Within, which is a full CG, PG-13, hyper... Dumpster fire. (laughs) In air quotations here, hyper-realistic art style. (laughs) It looks fucking awful, is what it does. So, you know, three years later, we have a show like this where it's, it's true, the... The animation looks very fluid. I love the action sequences in Apple Sea. That's one of the main draws to it, right? Oh, look, cool mechs fucking fighting. That's really what stands out to me the most with Apple Seed. But when you look at backgrounds, like, so there's like a, a scene where they're going through the city, um, and it's just, you see barely any models moving in the background. Like, maybe, <laughs> I think I counted maybe eight or nine, like, people moving and you don't see features of their faces or anything they're just like moving models and there's a car Mm -hmm. going through the city it looks very plain and basic and obviously there's limitations to cg and you know they're not going to animate that or make it look good like what what's the point right so and they were certainly limited by the hardware that they had at the time like i i I know the scene you're talking about and i can just imagine that whatever computer they were using to render all that just like struggling and you could hear the the fan like about to fucking burst at the seams yeah like by today's standards four of your fucking phones right now has more processing power than the computers we had back then so yeah yeah it's because of the time we got and it's hard it's hard to reimagine what it's like to be 18 years in the past. I'm sure some of you listening to this is pro- they're, you're probably younger than this movie. You know, this movie's older. Some, yeah, than me. there's probably people who listen to our podcast who are younger than this fucking movie. Which, good God, yeah. I feel old. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Dating ourselves uh, here, but yeah, you, I know. It's, it, I know it's hard to imagine being back in a time when you know computers were really bad (laughs) and this technology was brand spanking new like we're super spoiled in the realm of cg nowadays like i know it's hard for some of you youngsters out there to 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 fathom but there was a time when computers had no rgb on them whatsoever yeah (laughs) we were lucky to get a freaking light (laughs) you were lucky to get a freaking light light that told you the computer was on (laughs) (laughs) that's true oh man um Let's talk about let's talk about the uh, the sound and then the OST for a bit. So um, the score for the overall score for the movie was done uh, by Tetsuo, uh, Tetsuya Takahashi, um, and the OST itself included um, some EDM techno and trance music from the likes of Paul Oakenfold, Basement Jacks, Boom Boom Satellites, um, Ryuji Sakamoto, and a couple of other people, um, and. It's interesting. It's certainly not what you're used to hearing <laughs> okay. in an anime soundtrack. No, 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 no. Hold on. We got to back up here. It's not interesting. It's straight up fucking bad. Okay? Okay. I know. Okay, you... I didn't want to say it was, like, completely bad because listen, I used to listen to some of this music. I, <laughs> I like this movie, okay? Like, from the get-go, everyone should know this. I like this movie. <laughs> I have seen it so many times. I've rewatched it myself, personally. More than 10 times. Mm. And that's a lot. 
who rewatches that many movies? Like uh, one movie that many times. Very dedicated fans, I would say. However, my God, is the fucking scoring bad in this fucking movie? <laughs> like the only time I really liked the music is when I hear Ryuichi Sakamoto. If no one knows who Ryuichi Sakamoto is, do yourself a favor. He just released an album, um, I believe two years ago or last year, uh, his new album. It's still very beautiful. He does um, arrangements on pianos and stuff like that. And Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence is like my all time fucking favorite song from uh, Ryuichi Sakamoto. It's just a very mm-hmm. beautiful piano piece. Yeah, uh, it is it is really good, and he is a really good musician and composer. Uh, people should definitely check him out. Uh, I will say, like, you, like, I agree with you that if there is one um, one bright spot to the the OST of this, this movie, it, it is his music. Yeah, and there are a lot of jarring things about this movie. The music choice is another jarring thing, where you'll go from, like, hearing soft piano Ryuchi Sakamoto-style music to, like... Oh uh, yeah, hardcore rap. Yeah, fight scene. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> and it's also not helped by the fact that there are a lot of stock sound effects, some of which I oh fucking recognize God. where they're from. Yeah, and it, it, in all honesty, it seems like they spent five dollars on the music budget, <laughs> or they spent. It does. <laughs> I literally, anytime you hear a shotgun go off in this movie, it is the same exact sound that you will hear when you fire the shotgun in Halo Combat Evolved. I swear to God. So that's a public domain sound effect. And when you're creating things, like back in the day, we didn't have Creative Commons. Like Creative Commons licenses weren't um, abundant. So we had something mm-hmm. called public domain instead. Creative Commons is a new thing, relatively new thing, where we establish like uh, we can all use this to monetize and stuff. Yeah. So back in the day, you could only use public domain unless you wanted to spend the money to make it yourself. That was the biggest difference, yeah. right? Or you wanted to license actual sound effects from like stock sound effect places. Yeah. So, man, making stuff is expensive, just in general. It is. So that's why it gets into the millions of dollars very quickly. Yeah. And to be honest, when it comes to sound, it's a lot cheaper to source out and have someone like pay someone to give you sound or to just use Mm -hmm. it or you can save money by just using public domain stock effect stuff like that's just the cut and dry cut and jib the cut and jib of it (laughs) yeah i mean i I will say the amount of stock sound effects that i recognize i'm I'm shocked that i did not hear a wilhelm scream in this at least once. i was waiting for it honestly speaking you're right (laughs) and everyone knows the wilhelm because they use pretty much every other stock sound effect i recognized yeah and God, the the sound design is so bad in this because also the mixing isn't that great either. Yeah, because like the 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 dialogue is mixed so much softer than the actual music. Like anytime there's music and dialogue being played at the same time, I can barely understand what's being said. Yeah. And just again, I hate the abrupt jump cuts with random song and sound effects that clash. It's just mm-hmm. there's no transition phase between the sound effects and I hate it. It's literally someone's first fucking baby's first time at sound design or something where they they play a sound effect and instead of putting a transition like a fade in fade out or like putting a transitional song in between that kind of matches the BPM that go into yeah. the new one. It's literally just sound effect one sound effect two put together right next to each other. And <laughs> it's an audio it's an audio equivalent to just rapid jump cuts. Yeah, and oh god. <laughs> that is something that I definitely I'm sorry, Tatsuya Takahashi, if you're hearing this, if someone from from your sends this part where we talk trash about you, I'm so sorry, but bro, that shit was not good. Well, to be fair, I, I don't think he actually did the sound mixing. He just composed the score. Yeah. So I don't know who did the sound score or the uh, sound mixing for the, the movie Appleseed, but man. I could probably look that up, but... Uh, I mean, it, it honestly isn't worth it at this point. It's 18 years out not- of date. <laughs> Yeah, I'm hoping not, in 18 yeah, years they've really. gotten better at their job. I, I would hope so, or have found another job. <laughs> it just seems like this might have been outsourced to some interns. <laughs> it could have been. It could very well have been. Um, but let's actually talk about the, the narrative quality. Now, obviously, we won't get into to too many spoilers. Um, but one thing I do want to point out, we, we mentioned at the at the start of this, that this is an adaptation of a manga um, 
written by uh, Masamune Shiro, who also did the manga for Ghost in the Shell. Now, one thing this movie is not is a direct adaptation of that source material. It has settings, it has characters, it has certain story elements taken from that source material, but it is actually would be more accurate to say that it is a reinterpretation of the source material and not a direct adaptation. Yeah, so for those Uh, who don't know, um, there was actually an Appleseed movie question mark in 1998 released by it was also one in 1988 oh my god 1988 no way mm-hmm. i don't remember the 1988 i thought it was 1990 well it wasn't it wasn't actually a, a film in 1988 it was an ova okay so it was done by gynax too oh yeah yeah, yeah. the 1988 gynax one. <laughs> oh god it's so bad it looks like robotech like not even robotech it looks like uh well yeah that no that's what it spawns from it's directed inspired by uh robotech but mm-hmm. and for anyone who doesn't know robotech is what inspired macross uh fun tidbit of information there or they might in- i don't remember which one inspired which actually Man, you know you're what? full of like fun facts tonight aren't you i know a lot about again i'm big mech fan so uh i might be i might be confusing which one inspired what but they all basically belong in the same sphere of influence um the, the apple seed cinematic universe <laughs> Well, I'm talking about Robotech, Macross, and Appleseed. They all have inspirations either from each other or to each other. I forget. And I I don't remember which direction it goes in, but that's why they kind of look the same. There's a lot of crossover in terms of, like, element, like, story elements. Yeah. Like, the Appleseed design for, um, so we have our two main characters, which is funny fucking thing. So this movie, they have so many fucking weird names that it just seems impossible for Japanese people to pronounce, right? So our main Duna Newt, yeah. Briario Sec- he- Hecaton I can't Caris. even pronounce it. Jesus Christ. The Hecaton, Hecaton Care is like uh, a lot of this. Their names are based on Greek mythology. Greek. Yeah. Greek mythology. You know, like the Hecaton Tares, like the giants uh, of Titan or whatever. That is. There is a single Japanese named person in this and it's Hitomi. <laughs> no, there's two. There's also Yoshio. Oh, that's true. Mechanic. That's true. Yes. So, so the the main character's name is Dunan Newt, which sounds really cool, and we can pronounce it in English really well. Japanese, they can't fucking pronounce uh, Newt, so they say Natsu. <laughs> they call her Dunan Natsu. <laughs> it's so funny. <laughs> and then Briarios, uh, that one's pretty easy. They go Briarios. But Heka, yeah, yes, they yeah. never pronounce his last name because it's Heka Conter. Con- I can't even fucking say it either in English. It's really hard, but yeah. Hecaton Kiris. Heck, the Hecaton Kiris thing. <laughs> so they have really funny names. <laughs> And I love it. And like, and a lot of these are like directly like lifted out of Greek like mythology. There's Athena, uh, Hades. Nike, uh, Hades, Uranus. Yeah, like Major Uranus. <laughs> It's so funny. Edward Uranus the <laughs> Third. And I don't know if uh Masamune Masamune. Mas oh my god. Masamune Shiro. Yeah, I keep I I kept wanting to say Masashiro Mune for some reason. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I know. But Masamune Shiro, man, your fucking names. <laughs> I love them. Honestly speaking, I know. To an English speaking person, I love the names. But holy shit, did you hate your voice actors or something? Yeah, I mean, whew. um, I, I, it's, it's great for world building. I suppose that not everyone has a Japanese name, but Jesus Christ. Yeah. So on top of the abrupt, so the, like I said earlier, there's abrupt scene cuts, right? And Mm -hmm. on top of the music clashing, there's a bunch of just random fucking scenes that don't make any goddamn sense. We're like, there was one scene where they're at like a club or something. And then it jump cuts to like, now they're in a fucking field fighting and shit. And they're like, what? Yeah, they're like doing a training sequence. And like, there's no indication this is a training sequence. Yeah. Um, And it also, it also almost takes the, because you've seen a couple of, um, a couple of flashbacks in the film at this point already. And it almost takes the point of a flashback. So that's until you actually realize that it's a training sequence. It feels like you're watching a flashback. Yeah. So you really don't know like <laughs> how it starts in the beginning is like, we're in a battlefield, this and that. And then like flashbacks to like, there's flashbacks splattered throughout the fucking opening sequence for this and that. And it's all just so very confusing. <laughs> it's very mm. jarring. Cause again, just like how there's no transitional phase between the sound effects and music, there isn't one for the animation either. It's just literally on yeah. screen. 
Yeah. Uh, and, and they are, they are quite jarring. Um, especially if, if this is your first time watching it, like you're going to be really confused at some points and then you'll be like, Oh, okay. Now I understand because you've held my hand through this. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's another thing. Like, I, I feel like there are parts of the story, uh, that, and the dialogue too, which I think we should also mention, um, that there's really no nice way of saying this. They're cliche. Yeah, the the dialogue and the story itself is very boring. Um, it's not anything new, but I don't think... Like, there's a really clunky alle- uh, allegory for racism in the story. Yes, and <laughs> it's very clunky, but at the same time, I, I, I prefer to think about uh, the, the literal question they ask in the movie. So, one thing that is a running theme in that in this universe, in the Appleseed universe, is um, people versus machine, right? Man versus mm-hmm. machine. So they have things called bioroids in the film, which are basically like clones of humans, but they're superior because they're you know they're full on androids. So they bioroid is another uh, another fun word to hear Japanese people say. Bioroid. Bioroid. <laughs> yeah, and so instead of saying android, they're bioroids, and they're basically. <sighs> machine clone machines but they're also human right Mm -hmm. and one of the biggest thing in this film is that there's humans who are like no bioroids are not human you're just fucking pieces of machine you're clones you're you don't have rights and i can turn you off watch yeah and (laughs) you can do that with just talking to be honest anyway (laughs) wow (laughs) wow i had to take my shot anyway so fucking fucking sneak diss there thanks you're welcome (laughs) So the bioroids are disrespected by the humans, and humans don't see them as equals, and it's a running theme, which I'm like, you know, that could very well be the future, right? If we created robots, and a very Blade Runner-esque BTW, uh, where we have a future where we have androids or bioroids or whatever, and they seem like, they they act like humans, but the thing is, they don't have emotion, right? These uh, bioroids, and they don't. And they're built to help safeguard humanity because they don't have irrational emotions and thoughts. They only think in logical decisions, and they try to make decisions to preserve and continue the human race. And yeah, the main like, contention... They're, 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 they're essentially created to save humanity from themselves, yeah, right? And, because it's it's never outright stated, but like the... The implication in the like the backstory of this world is there was a nuclear war that destroyed most of the world. Yeah, and now the rest of the world is fighting for resources like water and food. Um, that's why Dune and Newt, she's uh, well trained, and she's like she, they pick her up from a battlefield in the very beginning because yeah. you know she's <laughs> it's kind of what you got to do around the world. Everyone's fucking fighting each other for fucking resources, so that's like just inherently yeah. in the background. And this, there's a lot of this movie that you're not going to understand without knowing things about Appleseed, which is a shame because it's actually a very interesting world that they build up and it's an interesting plot line, but there's a, yeah. because of the jarring jump cuts and all this information that the movie just assumes, you know, right? Like you wouldn't have known that Dune and Newt was fighting out in this world. And there was a nuclear fucking warfare that happened in the background. Like none of this is told to you. You just got to know. Yeah. The, the- they just they, they make passing references to a global war like two or three times and they just kind of expect you to just go along with it. Yeah, and because of that, you don't really know much about anything and it, it's very weird like that. And it, it definitely feels like a movie that was made for fans of the Appleseed franchise because of that, right? Like mm-hmm. comparing my first time watching it to like the 10th time I've watched it after I've dove into the universe, I've enjoyed it a lot more, to be honest, than I did before. <laughs> <laughs> it does. I will say, for all of its faults, it does have these moments in it that number. Well, number one, if you're a fan of just mecha or giant robots in general, you're going to like anyway. But it also has these moments of like they just lean into the idea of the rule of cool. Like good example, and I mentioned this before we started talking. Like there's a scene where a guy gets shot in the head, and the like the very stylistic way it's done. It's just it just it leans into the rule of cool, and it's like even after it's done, it's like this doesn't make sense. But boy, did it look cool! Well, even before that, like uh the way way that burarios is um like taking damage right like each fucking shot is like dramatic right like oh shoulder gets cocked back oh he shot his knee out so now he's kneeling and it's like boom boom 
boom it's like oh no it's like the slow-mo uh being shot in the chest thing that you see in uh action movies a lot right it's just cool yeah. to see that shit it's like very it is. hyper stylized and i like it like that yeah so i mean it does have that going for it if you like these stylized like sequences that just are really just there to be cool you might like the the style that they go with for for Apple C, but I think you and I are kind of in agreement that the story is probably one of its weakest parts. I would say the story is very weak, and other than the fact that I do agree with the whole like we need to think about if we as a society develop androids or biroids or whatever we we develop robots to the point where they seem like humans because again the major contention in this entire film is that these biroids are not humans and we have a human faction that hates them and wants them all to fucking disappear and die. And then we have the bioroids who are like, well, that's not fair. Like, we were just created to help you, dude. Like, what the heck? You know, and again, very similar to uh, Blade Runner and the whole, like, are clones real people or are yeah. machines real people? If you there's have also, There's also hints that. of that in the story of Ghost in the Shell as well. Yeah. And <laughs> maybe this is just the running theme I like in movies and shows. <laughs> like, the whole Ghost in the Machine and, like, where does... Because the line gets blurred, right? Like, if these are... Hmm things that uh these clones they're they look human they speak human they quite literally function like humans then where's the line are they still robots right yeah and it, again a very cool story and setup uh i think it's a really good execution of it too but man is the dialogue fucking weak carrying this because there's just not that much information out there for you to understand the world like they really yeah. should have spent a lot more time building up the world than just doing abrupt action cuts and showing, like, one of the biggest things that they do in the movie is they show how fucking badass Dunan is. Like, don't get me wrong. Mm. She's really fucking cool. I love her, right? But yeah. they spend... There's more than one sequence where they show... There's a very beginning sequence with Dunan where she's, like, a soldier just in a random fucking war field, and she's just kicking ass, right? Then there's another one where, like, the training sequence where she literally eliminates an entire squad of trained... uh as SWAT members, which is like this uh, police force that they have. She takes out 16 highly trained professional soldiers with literally she starts off with a knife and then she like mm -hmm. destroys everyone and takes their guns. <laughs> and, and, and then on top of that, there's another scene where she's moving like a, a metal frame body thing. Like it's it, basically it's a power suit and she's kicking ass with that. You know, like I'm like, I get it. Dunan is a fucking badass, okay? I get that she's super cool and she's a, a military prodigy, but dear God, did you really have to do those the three times? And that's not even the end of it, right? There's that scene where, um, again, the slow-mo scene where she uh, shoots the dude, right, when they're falling. Again, mm. super cool badass moment. I get it. Dunan is a badass. Stop telling me this movie. <laughs> I get it. I really do. Yeah, it's like it's telling you the same thing over and over again, and at some point you're like, all right, let's move on. I get this. Yeah. Go. Honestly, like, I thought the three by itself was already good enough, you know? I yeah. honestly think three was a little bit overkill. Like, the very first scene and the very second training scene, I thought that was good enough to reference the fact that she's mm. a fucking badass. And they could have spent yeah. a lot more time in the middle part, like, with the um the metal body, the the robot power armor scene they could have just spent that building more character and development and stuff instead of just, Hey, look at how cool Dunan is and fucking does Kung Fu. <laughs> like I get yep. it, dude. I get it. But yeah, I, I think that's pretty much it that we have in terms of the narrative. Uh, I, it's just, while there's some good ideas there, it is pretty clunky in how it portrays them. I think is probably a good way to put it. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. And again, this, this is a movie from 2004. Uh, the, Best thing about this is going to be the action sequences and how fluid the animation was. Thankfully, they didn't do 3D CG, which is completely different because then they would have done mocap and it would have been fucking awful. It would have looked terrible. And there's way more hardware limitations to that than just going to computer generated. So mm -hmm. <laughs> overall, I, I on again, I, I really like Appleseed because <laughs> knowing what I know now about the universe, about the story, I think it's just really cool. Um, I, I like the setup about the main contention, like, are bioroids human? Do they deserve to have rights? Do they deserve to be hu like human rights? Yeah, and it's like, <laughs> I just really like it. And the next movie after this, um, Apple Seed X Machina, does a fantastic job at expanding the universe about the bioroids and stuff, in my opinion. I feel like, so, 
one of the things I feel like with Appleseed is, you know, there's there's a lot of anime, especially older anime uh, these days that are getting remade. I feel like Appleseed is something that could probably get that treatment and probably be received way better today um, than it was before, especially if they had a more competent team working on it. Um, I'm not even saying I necessarily want like a remake that's 3D CG. Uh, or or CG or, or whatever. I'm just saying I think it's something that definitely could be remade better, um, especially with better writers and maybe more in line with the actual source material than this was. See, I don't mind that it was, wasn't was based on the source material because, again, this is kind of just like its own thing. But I definitely mm-hmm. agree that if I, this is one of the things that I would love to see remade with today's current technology like uh, Arcane just came out on Netflix, and you guys just did a spoiler mm-hmm. cast on it. Arcane looks fucking great. I love the stylistic choices they chose for Arcane, and I hate League of yeah. Legends. I know nothing about League of Legends, and I, I just hate the toxic community and the stuff that I see about it. Like I know the memes, obviously, but I just I played League for a little bit, and I didn't like it. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't say I hate yeah, it, it, but I inherently I don't like playing League of Legends. I, I feel like it's definitely something that could benefit from a, a reboot or, or, or remake. Um, although I feel like if they do, they need to go a series route with it instead of a movie route, because I feel like a story like this would lend itself to being better told through serialized storytelling than as a movie. Well, and one of the worst things is that, uh, so Appleseed does have more movie franchises after this. Um, Appleseed Ex Machina. Was that what I said it was? I don't remember. That's the, that's the second. Yeah. The, the, the sequel movie. So the sequel movie, it looks just as good. It's got a better storyline. It's got more world building. Overall, I think it's a really good sequel. But then there's a, mm-hmm. I guess it's kind of a prequel sequel movie. Kind of. I don't, there's a third one. Apple seed, you're talking about Appleseed Alpha? Yeah. So there's a third one that they just took like steps back. Like they, the animation got worse. They cut budgets and it's just overall a terrible experience. So I feel Mm -hmm. like that's what really put the nail in the coffin for, like, the franchise of (laughs) they didn't bring back the same um, team to do the animation, which is a shame. Mm -hmm. They really should have. And I would love to see it with – if they're going to remake it, I want to see a new CG studio that knows what they're doing. Like, whoever did uh, the Arcane, I would love to see them try to remake Appleseed. That would be great. Yeah. That would would be – Absolutely great. And yeah, like you said, there are other things to see in the sort of Appleseed uh, mythos. Uh, One of the things that was created, it was done by Production IG, um, and it was an OVA series of of 13 episodes. It was done back in two, uh, from 2011 to 2012. It was called Appleseed 13. Yep. Which is not, it doesn't tell really the story of Appleseed so much as it is like a story that's set in that universe. Also, they changed the name of Dunan. They changed it from Dunan Newt to Dunan Knots. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand why they... Mm, whatever. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I, I feel like this is something that they could definitely could benefit from a um, from a remake. Um, all that being said, though, what out of 10 do you give it, John? <laughs> like I said, I'm biased. I like mecha stuff. I'm pretty easily pleased by action stuff, so I... Honestly, it's more of a 7 out of 10 experience for me. Like, I don't hate them. Even, again, this is a movie that I've seen 10 times at this point by now. And rewatching it, I still like the movie. Like, I still like the mm. the storyline, the, the world building. I still like everything about it, even though I know it's bad. <laughs> like, I can't object- objectively score this without my bias just flowing over. Like, because honestly speaking, if if I were to score it, Based on if I didn't like it, I'd probably give this more like a four or a five out of ten. Like it's very average because mm-hmm. it, it's average. Like who cares? You don't learn anything. If it was a standalone, I knew nothing about it. I'd give it like a four or five out of ten. But because I know about the universe and I again I really like the sequel and and the action sequences are really cool and it's very fluid. Seven out of ten. Okay. I mean, I, I don't score it too much lower than you. I give it a 6.5 out of 10, mostly because I do feel that there is a lot of potential in this story. It just could be told so much better. And yeah, I do like the whole cyberpunk, you know, dystopian aesthetic of it. So, and uh, as much as you are a kind of a whore for like Mecca, I'm a whore for that kind of a setting. So yeah, we should stop picking uh, shows that like lean into our taste. <laughs> I know. Really, we need to start we reviewing shows review, that we like, don't know, or, or we need to review movies that we don't know or 
that people just hate or something. Because I feel like if anyone out there has a suggestion for a legitimately horrible, like objectively bad anime movie that you would like to hear us review, please let us know because I want to actually do something that we would rate like a two or a three out of ten at best. Um, yeah, that being said, that is, um, Appleseed, 2004's Appleseed. Um, the next, uh, movie we will be, bleh, the next movie we will be reviewing is Satoshi Kon's, uh, Tokyo Godfathers. I feel like we so, only uh, watch Satoshi Kon films. <laughs> we have, re- we've reviewed, I think, three of his movies at this point, um, <laughs> I think this will be the third Satoshi Kon movie we reviewed at this point. Yeah, we've so, done uh, um, Paprika and Perfect Blue, right? Yeah, so this will be the third. Um, maybe maybe the next one I'll suggest to be Millennium Actress so we can just round it out. <laughs> Jesus. To be fair, though, uh, one thing about Satoshi Kon is that even people who aren't into anime know who Satoshi Kon is. Because he's, yeah, sure. he's very revolutionary. For sure. like his he's, his he's movies a... are super iconic. And got my God, a guy who's gone too soon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely look forward to that. Um, so that will be our next uh, anime movie review that we do, as chosen by Natai. Um, until that time, thank you all out there for dropping in to listen to us. Check the description below to find links to Anime Club, After Dark, on Twitch, on social media, and on Discord. Um, you can also check out our merch store where we have all kinds of lovely little things that you can buy, and it does definitely supports and helps us out too. Uh, with that, I have been your host Alex, and I will see you next time. Say goodnight, John. Good night. Briarius! <laughs> Hades! Beneneta. God, why? <laughs> why would they name the characters such hard names to pronounce in Japanese? <laughs> and then you just have Hitomi. <laughs> Hitomi. Hitomi. <laughs> Oh,